again, like I said, I'm very fortunate to have been around that caliber of um, coach, you know, because these guys are, are continued, you know, they, their success has just sort of grown from, from where we were, when we were all together. And, um, you know, like I said, I've learned um, most of what I learned sort of from that, that sort of having that structure um, for the way that elite basketball is, is, is to be played is through that coaching all of that coaching pedigree that existed in Xavier while I was there for four years. Welcome in, Xavier fans, to the Xavier Basketball 100 Years Podcast, brought to you by Heartland Bank. I, Brad Redford, will be your host as we connect with some of the most famous Xavier coaches and players in Muskie history. And in today's episode, I welcome in two-time NBA champion, 2003 National Gatorade Player of the Year, and Xavier grad, David White. Um, Okay, so I kind of want to start with your early years playing basketball. And I think every player has a different way of how they kind of fall in love with the game. But what was it for you that connected you to the game of basketball? Uh, Oh, initially it was my older brother playing. Um, He was about uh, maybe 14 years, 14 or 15 years older than me, maybe even more than that. Uh, 16 years older than me. Um, and so he, uh, uh, when he was playing in college, I was a really, really young kid. And um, I would just, you know, fan after him, fan after his teammates. Like they were my first basketball sort of idols or whatever. And um, I looked to them um, and just used to enjoy watching them play. And then I fell in love with the game because I was close to it. My dad always had a hoop up, um, you know, and like I said, my brother played. So that's where I first initially just got into the game. And then as I got older, um, you know, I grew up in northern New Jersey. So, you know, we played in the park all the time. Um, you know, we started playing one-on-one and 21. And, um, you know, we spent hours upon hours in the park, um, you know, kids in my neighborhood and myself just playing. And then, um, you know, I just stuck with it. Um, I had some rough moments. Um, I think every player goes through, you know, rough moments, or, you know, where they doubt themselves. But um, you know, I was able to just keep pushing as a as a as a young player, particularly through the you know, through my my early formative years. Was there that aha moment where you kind of figured it out? You know, was there? Did you finally beat your older brother? And you're like, actually, I think I can be pretty good at this game if I stick with it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I had started um, – I used to play point guard for his men's league team. Um, and so, you know, that was that was a big deal now that I look back on it, um, just having that experience of being able to play against older men and, um, you know, have to do things at a certain level to be successful. And that was something that, you know, really helped me get better when I was younger. Um and it was never really a big deal. I, I, you know, we didn't. I didn't grow up in that. I got to beat him to prove myself. It was more or less, um, you know, just as you get older, you feel like people start to respect you more for uh, what you can do as a, uh, a basketball player. Um, so it was like when you know, for me, it was like when I would go to the park, and all of a sudden it was like, "Yo, yeah, you want to run with us?" Like the older guys start picking me up to play on their team. So I was no longer playing with the, you know, with the younger guys and playing on what we call the little court. They were like, you know, nine foot goals or whatever. You know, I started getting picked up by the older guys. And then you go from getting picked up to being in literally the first five that played. So it it was moments like that that really started to build my confidence. Um, Even, you know, and that was the same time where, um, you know, I was having issues in um, particularly my first couple of years in high school um, in New Jersey. Um, you know, uh, as a sophomore, I wasn't playing varsity, so I had a little attitude about that. And so I decided, hey, I'm just going to, you know, thug it out on JV, play a whole bunch, win a whole lot of games, which we did. Um, but, you know, you still have that. You know, I carried that um, that with me. Um, so even though, you know, things may not have been going the way that I wanted as a sophomore you know, in high school basketball, you know, I was still – able to like, you know, have that respect in the park and things. And so that helped me continue on in terms of my confidence. Um, and then, you know, we transitioned and moved to North Carolina. Um, you know, obviously basketball is a different animal in the South. Um, 
So I saw, you know, the physicality change, the nature of the athletes change, and, um, you know, the seriousness in which they take high school sports and grassroots sports in this area was a, was a step in terms of just the intensity was a step up from what I was used to. So that was another growing moment. Um, but again, it was a, a positive a positive step that, that kept me on my, my journey. Well, you always played with an intensity. It seemed like you always played with that chip on your shoulder, whether you were at home, whether you were on the road. Um, you know, you always seem to have that physicality, that enthusiasm for, for playing the game. And so when did uh, the recruiting process start to pick up for you? And when did you get an idea that maybe Xavier was at school for you? Uh, well, you know, I, you know, I had a uh, struggled academically to get eligible. Um, so I had to do an extra year of high school, Harvard military, which was, you know, again, one of the toughest years of my, uh, of my life, you know what I mean? Like as a young person, you don't want to get stripped of, you know, everything and be told when to wake up, when to eat, how long you can eat, uh, when you can sleep. You have no no privacy, no, uh, you know, you got a window, a, a, a glass window on your door. So anybody walking by can be there. Um, you know, you're sharing showers with guys. Um, it's just a wake up call, you know what I mean? Like, and for me, I was in an environment where, um, you know, because I didn't graduate high school on time, I was like, "Look, this is your 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 last shot to get your high school diploma." So I was I was in a in a situation where I was like, "Look, you just can't mess this up." So I had to, you know, really grow up, get outside of myself, start doing work, start applying myself, you know, start taking serious my conditioning. Like I remember that was the first time in my life this was like so. This was eighteen, nineteen years, eighteen years old. And I was like winning suicides for the first time. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. it was, it was, um, it was a, a switch that went off. And then it was just being in that environment. Um, you know, I was getting, still getting lightly recruited. I wasn't getting recruited at all as a senior at Garner. So um, I had a little bit of interest. Some people were saying, you know, come Prop 48. My parents were in a position to do that. So uh, you know, military school was the best option. And at military school, you know, I got the exposure that I needed. Um, it was in October, I think. Uh, I played with my AAU team uh, at Charlie Weber. They used to have this Charlie Weber tournament in Maryland. Uh, Coach Battle, who was then assistant and Coach Prosser, saw me. Um, I was on one of the the far courts, and um, I'll never forget it. I was playing, getting up and down, and we stopped at the free throw line, and I saw this dude peek his head around the curtain, glasses, sitting in a chair. And he kind of just gave me this look, and I was like, okay. Like, he kind of looked at me. You know you know that look you get yeah. from a guy like, you know, he like, he approved, kind of approves of what you're doing. So I'm like, all right. I had no idea who he was. And, you know, after that game, uh, he came up to me, introduced himself, and was like, look, you know, I'm not in a position to offer you a scholarship, but, you know, we want you at, at Xavier. Um, I was like, okay. I, I didn't know much about Xavier at all. Um and he just, you know, from that point on, Coach Battle was just all, you know, he was just on me. He was the, you know, he was, you know, he's out recruiting, you know, the people who were who were recruiting me. Um, and Coach Prosser came and saw me. Um, oh, I thought we played at Fourth Union. Um, and, you know, I had a pretty good game that night. Um, it was actually competing against um, the Knicks second-round draft pick. Um, and because it was the NBA lockout, he decided not to go back mm back to Europe and he stayed um, at uh, at Fork Union and played. Um, and so, you know, we I competed against him. We won. And Coach came out of the stands, walked across the floor. It was the first time he saw me play. He offered me a scholarship on the spot. He was like, man, I'm offering you a scholarship to Xavier. Wow. Um, did, did Coach I, Prosser say what it was about your game that he just fell in love with instantly? N- n- no, he just – he I just – he just walked across, introduced himself. He said, "I, I," he said, "You, you fit what we want to do. Um, I want you, I want you to come today. Um, let me know if I'm going to be in touch as soon as I get back to Cincinnati." And uh, you know that Monday when I got, you know, when we, you know, basically, um, you know, we're checking in after that. It was the weekend we played, and um, that Monday at Hargrave, I was on the phone with him, on the phone with Coach Battle. Um, I think Coach Prosser, you know, may have gone and visited my parents that same week. Um, you know, they just really turned up the heat more than anybody. So, um, you know, by the by the spring, um, 
um, early spring. Whenever that visit period was, mm-hmm. I went and took my visit. Um, you know, loved the place, loved the people. I was, you know, James Posey took me around. I stayed with Darnell Williams, you know, a bunch. He was my host. And, um, you know, Coach B and Coach Prosser, Coach Smith, those guys really sold the university. And, um, you know, everything about it fit what I needed. Um, you know, I needed the, the small environment. I needed the, uh, uh, I needed the constant basketball and, you know, as few distractions as possible. Well, it didn't take you long to establish yourself as a big time player. Your freshman year, you almost averaged a, a double double. Uh, so, how did you transition your game so quickly um, and effectively at the college level? Well, it was that year at military school. We were playing, you know, college uh, JV teams. We were playing junior college teams. We were playing, uh, you know, other prep teams. Uh, we played international teams. Uh, played like 40 or 45 games or something like that. So, and, you know, we were training every day, you know, couldn't go home when we wanted, um, you know, constantly in the gym, in the weight room. And when I got to Xavier, it was particularly because of the small environment. Um, it was a smooth transition, you know, in Tatum, Virginia, on campus in the middle of nowhere, you know, um, wearing military stuff and, you know, going to military school. Not saying that that's what, you know, Xavier's campus is, but it's a very uh, insulated, um, very private uh, private space. And, you know, that's what I saw in, in, in terms of Xavier. Like, we were in, you know, classes with less than, you know, 15 people sometimes. And so you were able to, you know, uh, develop relationships with professors and get individual, um, you know, attention and be able to express, express yourself um, and not be, you know, one of, you know, 200 or whatever it is sometimes in these, in these larger spaces. And then I know what I needed. And, you know, um, once Xavier got involved, it's weird how recruiting works. Once Coach Prosser and Coach B started recruiting me and people started, all of a sudden other schools started calling, right? Like, hey, we really think you're good. And so it's just like this. Yeah, that, uh, I when, knew. Yeah, that's when Dayton and UC started calling and, and you did the right thing. You didn't answer the phone. <laughs> right, but that's when you know, like, you know, it's like, okay, you got to, you know, find what's best for you. And that small environment, um, you know, that sort of family-like environment where you're very insulated, um, you're still able to experience college life. But you're, and you're also experiencing a super high level of college basketball, which is what I wanted, um, you know, was a, was, a, was a good fit for me. And then Sister Flamma, you had a pretty good relationship with her, didn't you? Did she have a, an effect off the court as yeah. well? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, sister got me serious about just, <laughs> you know, focusing and doing what I was supposed to do. Um, you know, I wasn't a great student my whole life. And, um, you know, she figured out ways to, to keep me engaged, made me, you know, made me want to take pride um, in that. And, you know, sister was a part of, um, you know, she was a part of that journey. You know, there she, you know, she kept her foot on the gas with all of us. And, you know, she made sure every single guy that came in, um, you know, with the group I came in with, some of the guys I was there with, she made sure everybody got a degree, uh, which is a miracle in itself. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. uh, you know, she she was able to really, um, you know, I think ground us in the fact that we needed to take pride in other parts of ourselves. You know, when you know, sometimes you can get lost in just being a, a ball player, ball player, ball player. But, you know, she made that a point, um, you know, made us accountable for what we were doing in the uh, you know, in the school portion of our experience as they Well, you're saying you're saying all the right things. I mean, I, I wish I was a little bit more dedicated to my schoolwork <laughs> early on in my Xavier career. Uh, I think for yeah, me, yeah. it took it took an injury for me to uh, take that side of my life a little bit more seriously, and in some ways, that injury ended up becoming a good thing for me. Um, so, okay, yeah. I, I, when I ask people about uh, you know around Xavier and their favorite David West memories, you get a different game. I mean, you had so many big games during your career here at Xavier. Everyone has a different moment. Um, are there any games, whether in the NCAA tournament or regular season games, that stand out to you in particular? Um, let me see. You know, I don't – I mean, I, people like to talk about the Dayton game, which was a big game, not in my, my mind, not because of just the scoring, but, just, you know, um, in that moment, you're thinking about, 
I think we were in a conference battle or whatever. So if we had lost that game, so then we would have gone down two games with like, you know, and it would be very hard to recover, you know, two games um, down in the conference. So that was a big part. And I just remember that energy, uh, you know, that the energy you feel, um, that pressure you feel um, is like, that's part of the reason why we play, right? It's like to feel that rush and to be in those high intense moments and, you know, you know, every single possession, every single pass, catch, dribble is super duper important. Um, you know, so that was a that was a you know, always a highlight just from the basketball environment standpoint. And then obviously the games, the battles with Cincinnati, um uh were memorable and uh, you know, I would say just when we would go on the road and win in certain places, I would always you know, sometimes we would watch you know, obviously teams at the time in uh, the 11 10, we would see, you know, the game, you know, other teams and other uh, uh, universities and other conferences. And they know what they would say, bigger conferences, ACC, SEC, whatever. But we would see those, we would see those games and be like, man, those environments don't look that great. Like, unless it was like Carolina Duke or some premier game, the environments didn't look. But, you know, when we were in the A-10, we were going into play like, places like St. Joseph's and going into Temple, and we play at LaSalle. You know, we do the, the three teams in Philadelphia. and You know, you go into George Washington and, you know, go to Dayton. These are some high – I mean, some of the most intense basketball environments, you know, you could imagine. And, you know, we were generating the type of energy, you know, in our game, um, you know, like, you know, one night we're up in – St. Bonaventure, and the place is literally just rock. You can't hear guys call plays, and it's like, like, yeah, this is a small environment, but the energy, the atmosphere is at, you know, an all-time peak. And you know, those are some of the things that I remember most about, you know, the games and the environment. You know, it was the environment. It was those, you know, going into those college spaces where the crowd is literally two steps off the floor, and people aren't sitting down. You know, they're screaming and yelling, even free throws, timeout. Like, those are the moments that, you know, I remember most. Yeah, it's funny you say that because one of my favorite places to play in the A-10 was St. Bonaventure. Uh, it was in Olean, New York. Yeah. It was the biggest yeah. ticket in town. It was a sold-out house. And it was like playing back in my high school days in Michigan. And it was bleacher seating. Yeah. The students were two feet away from you. And I, I yeah. loved hearing all the negative things that they had to say about me. So it was yeah. that, that yeah. I enjoyed. Um, so right. I, I want to kind of touch on your leadership role as a player because it always seems like you were so vocal. You know, were there any other players during your time at Xavier where, you know, maybe it was two or three of you guys that uh, really demanded that leadership role and that vocal role as players? Yeah, you know, I never really um, – you know, I, I don't think it's anything – I don't think we ever even did team captain. Um, you know, we always tried to, you know, have this – you know, team accountability, group accountability. Um, you know, I think it started with, you know, us making sure that we, you know, the players making sure we played pickup. You know, we didn't have to be told, you know, the schedule pickup games. Like, we naturally did that ourselves. We found out the window that we had, the time slot that we had, and, you know, we tried to get in there and play as much and as often as possible. Um, so the leadership thing, I don't think it was – I think sometimes when you're like, you, you know, you, you stand out and you stand out on the team, then people automatically assume that you're the guy that come in the locker room. But we had, you know, again, we had, um, you know, Lionel was a big part of our leadership core. Um, as a freshman, um, well, after after our freshman year, he became basically the main cog of our leadership core. But, you know, Mo, Mo McAfee and Darnell mm -hmm. Williams as a freshman, they were the, you know, leadership. Kev Fry, who was, uh, you know, there with me for three years. He was, a, you know, part of our leadership. Um, you know, Romain was a big part, even though he was quiet. But Romain led by example. He's the hardest worker in the locker room. You know, demanded. Like, he was, you know, on me about improving my mile time because he knew how much I hated to run um, <laughs> you know, the mile. But, you know, he was like, come on, Dave. You got, you got, you got to get it better. You know, like, you know, he was, <laughs> he was, he, but you know what I mean? That's a, that's a yeah. form of leadership. So. Well, um, I, I would know, trade 
I would trade my yeah. Xavier Mile record for any one of your records that you have at Xavier. So if you oh if you want to trade, I'm happy to. I wouldn't mind taking your third all time in scoring, um, and then I'll give you my mile time. Got you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, I want to touch on Coach Prosser and, and Coach Mata as well. You played two years for Coach Prosser, two years for Coach Mata. Um, just curious how those two impacted your game as a player and, um, you know, obviously Coach Prosser, maybe the impact that he had uh, with you early on in your career. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I got very – I tell people all the time, I got very, very, very fortunate. The, um, you know, the coaching that I've been, um, you know, blessed to be a part of or whatever you want to call it, recruited to be a part of, the coaching pedigree that I've been around, um, you know, I got lucky. Um, I tell people that, you know, a lot of what I know about the game and, you know, how I apply it um, is really a testament of the people that, you know, that coach me and the way that they coach me. Um, so, you know, you know, Coach Prosser had, um, you know, he came in and was, uh, you know, hard on me to a degree, but he always, let me know that I should be very proud of my effort and, you know, the things that I was doing, you know, the way I was going about my business, which was different. Um, you know, he was, um, you know, he was someone who gave me that, you know, that confidence. You know, he told me, Coach Battle pulled me in the office one day, said, man, Coach, is going to tell you something. He said, but I want, I'm going to tell you first, I'm going to tell you, I'm like, what does he want? It's like, look, man, he's going to ask you to be that guy. And I'm like, what does that mean? And he's like, man, he's gonna he he wants to know that he can depend on you to get us going, you know, to start the game. You know, that we can close the half with you. We can start the stuff, we can close the game with you, we can get the fight. And I'm like, he's gonna say that. You know what I mean? Like I'm mm-hmm. sitting there like and he was like, Yeah. And five minutes later, Coach pulls me in his office and he was like, Look, he was like, you know, you gotta step into this role. I need you to step into this role. I think you're good enough to step into this role. But you got to work and make yourself believe. It. It's like I think you can be a guy. You can be in all A10. You know the, the whole thing. The all A10 perform. I believe you can be the best guy in this conference. You know we got to put in. You know a whole lot of work. You know and this was after my freshman year, and um, you know he just really put a battery in my back and you know boosted me forward. You know Coach Smith, Coach Battle, um, you know Coach Gaudio. Um, you know all you know Coach Smith and Coach uh, Gaudio have been head coaches at a high level. Um, you know, and they were there um, pushing um, Coach Gaff my rookie year. You know, Chris Mack was, was there um, pushing and, and driving. Like I said, very fortunate to be around some, some brilliant basketball people and learned a whole bunch, um, you know, from them along the way. And Coach was really, you know, when you have a head coach, again, I was a kid that had, was just lightly recruited. You know, there were people questioning certain things about me, like my size and my my it or whatever they whatever they used to say, um, but then to have somebody just with that affirmative, I think you're good. I think you can play. He did, this was the first he saw me play one time, and that was it. Coach Battle saw me play one time, and that was it. And they immediately said, you know, we want you to come. You know, they both said, you know, we're not going to promise you an opportunity to start, but we think that you know you have the opportunity to start um, right away as a freshman. I said, wow. And, you know, we just went from there. Yeah, it's interesting. You have certain uh, moments in your life you felt like were just meant to be. And kind of when I hear you yeah. talk about that moment where Coach Battle saw you and, and that first interaction with Coach Prosser, it just felt like it was an easy decision for you to come to Xavier um, and do what you did. I, I did speak with uh, Coach Mata about you a couple weeks ago. Um, he, he had some very nice things to say about you, as I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised about that. But the one thing that he said that kind of stuck out to me is he told all of his players at Ohio State, he said each year uh, about David West's toughness and, and your mind and how mentally tough you were. Um, so what is it about you that makes you seem unbreakable on the surface? I, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, when Coach Mata came to Xavier, um, you know, he was straight up. With, with me, he said, you got to be thinking NBA. Maybe this year, definitely next year, that we're, we're, you're thinking NBA. Um, you know, Coach Mata got me thinking about, you know, sort of being an every play kind of guy, trying to do 
um, and, and being an everyday kind of guy in terms of practice and my approach and sort of um, bringing out, you know, what I was going to be and how I was going to fortify myself from, you know, from day to day, you know, and actually doing it, like actually getting in the weight room and, you know, staying consistent with my mental approach. Um, and then he challenged me to develop and evolve, right? Um, start facing the basket, start putting the ball on the floor, become a, you know, work on your vision, work on your handle, be able to pass it sooner, make, you know, sharper decisions, um, you know, become a guarantee. And I used to be like, what do you mean? Like when, when the, before the game, before the game starts, we got to have a guarantee 20 and 10 or whatever it is on the board. And I'm like, okay. Um, you know, and that's, and that was sort of the pressure. And then again, you know, he has Coach Gross, head coach, Coach Miller, head coach, Alan Major, the former head coach. These are the guys he brings in, and they all pour into me, you know. Um, you know, a member, you know, Coach Major would, you know, again, do everything um, within, you know, his power to help. You know, we were in the gym constantly. Coach Gross was, you know, challenging me in ways that I hadn't been challenged. And Coach Miller was doing the same. Um you know, he, you know, the best game I had at Xavier, Coach Miller pulled me aside, looked me in my face and said, you know, it don't mean a damn thing if you don't win. He said, so, I, you know, like, and I mean, you know, cussed me. I'm like, man, I'm having a good game. And he's like, if we don't win, it means nothing. I mean, and I'm like, okay, you know, fine. But, I mean, it was, again, like I said, I'm very fortunate to have been around that caliber of um, coach, you know, because these guys are, are continued, you know, they, their success has just sort of grown from from where we were when we were all together. And um, you know, like I said, I've learned um, most of what I learned sort of from that that sort of having that structure um, for the way that elite basketball is, is is to be played was through that coaching, all of that coaching pedigree that existed in Xavier while I was there for four years. Well, guys at your skill and talent level don't always want to take on that coaching and pieces of that mentorship, but it sounds like you did a, a nice job of balancing your talent and skill, but also taking pieces from coaches and kind of honing onto their words to make you become an even better player. Um, oh, oh, yeah, you, you have to, you have to. I mean, that's just that's like the secret sauce um, for all the young young fellas that may or, that may hear this. And that's the secret sauce, you know, allowing yourself to be coached, allowing yourself to accept, you know, um, you know, instruction, trying to apply instruction, um, and being able to adjust. Um, that's the secret sauce. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the secret sauce to this thing. So. Well, your senior year, you averaged 20 and 11. So, you know, I don't know if Coach Miley told you those were the exact numbers that you needed to get, but you averaged 20 and 11. You were National Player of the Year. You were a consensus All-American. Uh, Xavier had a great year that year as well. You know, what did that mean to you to win that award? Yeah, you know, I, I never focused on individual like – I just never focused on the individual accolade part of it. I just pushed um, myself to try to – win games, to try to, you know, be successful, to try to have a good time, to try to, you know, have fun and enjoy, um, you know, the challenge of, you know, going up, you know, going to these different places and enjoy the challenge of being in the college basketball environment. And then ultimately, you know, my last couple of years were really just focused on, you know, trying to improve myself, looking forward, um, looking ahead. Um, and again, winning, you know, winning awards is just, you know, I think I've always thought about where I was four years prior to that, right? Trying to, you know, hoping and you know, wishing. You know, I remember that September after uh, uh, at the start of my year at uh, Hargrave, feeling like, okay, you didn't graduate from high school. Now you're doing another year of high school. You don't have any scholarship offers yet. Um, man. And then from that moment, you know, fast forward four years later, you know, basically, you know, being at the, the peak or at the top of of, uh, of college basketball felt really good. Yeah, and it meant a lot for the program. I mean, I, I remember being recruited by Xavier, and, you know, one of the first things they bring up is David West being player of the year. And, and it goes to show that I don't care how talented of a player you can be, you can make it happen at Xavier. And, and you showed that yeah, I think, to every player that's decided to come to Xavier. I mean, that's one of the first things every coaching staff, even though it changes, 
you know, it seems like every five years, that's still one of the first things that they bring up. So it made a huge impact on the program. Even though I know individual accolades aren't your maybe your favorite thing to always focus on or talk about, but it definitely meant a lot for the program. I do want to fact check one thing, though. So just help me understand this. So your jersey was retired while you were a player at Xavier? Yeah. So we played. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, they retired the jersey, and then we played three more games. Wow! So that was yeah, yeah, that wow. was a yeah, that was a that was pretty that was pretty cool. Um, and like I remember, Mr. Rabinsky, who was the athletic director at the time, he said, "David, there's no reason to wait. Mm-hmm. Like, there's literally no, there's absolutely no reason to wait. You know, why would we wait? We got you here right now. You you know, we know we're going to retire it. Let's just do it now." get it up there. It'd be great for the program. So mm-hmm. I was like, okay, cool, man. No issues with me. All right. Well, I had to do a fact check. I had never heard of that before. I, I didn't even know that was a thing that happened, but that's, if, if you're good enough to get your Jersey retired while you're playing, I mean, the only uh, thing I've heard of like that is Nick Saban getting a statue at Alabama. But other than that, it's uh, the only uh, thing it's you and Nick Saban. Oh, okay. All right. I got you. <laughs> Come on over. Now, to run a successful business, you need to develop a strong relationship with your accountant, your attorney, and most importantly, your community banker. If you find it hard to get advice from your bank, maybe it's time to consider Heartland. I'm Scott McComb, CEO, coming over to Heartland, where banking really feels good. Rare banking feels good. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. All right, I want to move on to uh, your life in the NBA. You were the 18th pick in the 2003 draft, which arguably is the best draft of all time. LeBron, D. Wade, Carmelo, Chris Bosh. And, I mean, I think without a doubt you're top five in that draft class. Uh, But how did you adjust to life in the NBA? Because you you go from being at Xavier, being in a small class size, a lot of structure. Now you move on to the NBA. You have guys with a ton of money. Uh, You're in a a big city. New Orleans is very lively. I've spent only a couple weekends in New Orleans. And if I had to live there, I I don't know if I would make it out. So how did you (laughs) how did you adjust to life going from college basketball, being in that Xavier program and then moving on and, and having some, you know, a decent amount of uh, change in your pocket and, and playing in New Orleans. Yeah, well, it was you know it was quite an, an adjustment. Um, you know, I was one of the guys. I got married very young, so I got married right out of college. Um, you know, to my wife. Uh, oh God, we've been married now like seventeen, eighteen years or something now. But um, you know, so I went down there. We went. Well, I went first, and then she came. You know, a few a few months later. But it was it wasn't that hard. Um, like I said, because you know I was. 22 I was grown and I was an adult you know what I mean I was I was I was you know the the biggest adjustment for me you know was the pace of the was actually the game it wasn't life it was the game Mm -hmm. um I had already you know you know um, Byron Larkin who's a you know major legend you know Byron and I had developed a really really good relationship um Byron was in financial management so he and I had been talking literally for two years about just um, you know, being smart, the opportunity to present yourself. He's like, man, I'd love to just talk to you about it, but you need to, you know, really think about being smart, structurally understanding what's going on and how to maintain money. And, you know, he started that very, very early. So I had, you know, again, I got, um, you know, working with Byron and linking in with my, my financial advisor, John. Um, you know, we developed a, a, a structure around, you know, the business of basketball. So I was very comfortable moving and transitioning into the NBA. Uh, it was the actual basketball, mm-hmm. you know, that was the toughest adjustment for me. Um, and, you know, it took time. It took me a couple of years to really get my, my feet under me. Part, part of it was I needed to gain some weight. Um, I came in at 226. And, you know, what's funny is now that's not, you could, I, you know, you can get away playing power forward at 226 pounds right now. Mm-hmm. But, uh, in the early 2000s, um, through the mid 2000s, um, it really was impossible. So I, I got banged up my first couple of years yep. just because I wasn't heavy enough. Um, you know, got my got got up to about 240. Um, you know, was able to get you know put my legs underneath me. Um, you know, we drafted Chris Paul a few years after I was I was in New Orleans, and we were able to propel you know the franchise you know to respectability while we were there and, 
you know, again, I enjoyed my NBA, uh, my NBA run. You know, I was able to, you know, win a couple championships, you know, be a part of a, uh, you know, a rebuild and a, a growth project in Indiana that we were, we were super successful in. And, um, you know, again, it took one of the, you know, the all time great teams, uh, you know, to beat us, you know, a couple of years. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed my time in Indy. And then ultimately, like I said, went on and played with, um, with San Antonio for a year and then Golden State for two years, went to championships. Uh, so, you know, my run was, was good. I enjoyed it. I got what I wanted to get out of it. Um, was able to get, um, you know, a doctorate in basketball, if you will. Um, you know, just from the people that, you know, again, I've been, I mean, you know, I've been very fortunate, um, you know, for the, the coaches that I've, I've been around. And, you know, I, I one day I'm going to sit down and write all, I, I write all of their names down um, and just, you know, think about the contributions that each one, you know, made to me because, you know, I take my basketball, you know, what I know about the game, I take it pretty serious, you know, probably most, more serious than a lot of people do because, um, you know, I value and, and equate it to, you know, it's a currency in a lot of ways because basketball is a, is a language that, you know, people speak all over the world and, you know, having achieved, you know, the heights of, of the NBA and, also, you know, coupled with being coached by some of the, you know, the greatest minds in the game, um, you know, I, I think what I know and, and, and um, you know, what I've been able to learn about the game is super valuable. And I think, you know, players should more often look at that. Um, you know, think about the people that you were in the locker room with. Think about, you know, um, you know, the scout reports that you watch these coaches put together and the way you, you know, watch them make adjustments and coach. And, you know, one of the things that we will always remember, we always have it, as athletes, right, is, is our knowledge and the know-how of the game. And that's what, you know, again, in life in general, one of the things that I get um, that I feel most uh, uh, positive about is my ability to teach the game um, and instruct the game and help young people develop and grow in the game. And um, I think it's a great way to, you know, to, to mentor young people to touch and, 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 and continue to contribute to the development of young people. Um, and you can instill certain value, you know, in people through competition and through sport. And so I value all of that, you know, the aesthetics, not just playing and being successful on the court, but the whole experience, like watching, you know, Greg Popovich for a year, um, you know, watching how he prepares, watching and listening to Tim Duncan be coached and Manu Ginobili get coached, you know, being in the locker room with Steph Curry for, for two seasons, championship run, Steve Kerr, Mike Brown, um, you know, Ron Adams, who's a, you know, all-time great defensive-minded um, coach. Um, you know, it's, you know, I, this stuff is invaluable. Um, you know, Ettore Messina, who's won multiple Euro League championships in San Antonio. You know, Byron Scott, who was in New Orleans, who's, you know, part of the Showtime Lakers. Jim Clemens, who was in New Orleans, who, uh, you know, won championships. Every championship, Phil Jackson won. Jim Clemens won as a coach. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I've been very fortunate, um, you know, to learn a lot about the game. And so that has contributed to, um, you know, who I am and what I am as a player and sort of what I continue to add um, as I'm no longer playing, um, what I continue to add to the game of basketball is hopefully, you know, again, impacting young people, giving them the game, um, you know, as I see it. Did you have one coach or a teammate that impacted you the most? Um, I know it's probably hard to put one name to that, considering all the different people you played for and the different guys you played with that were not just NBA All-Stars like yourself, but also future Hall of Famers, uh, you know, finals MVPs. Were there any, any guys that you kind of still keep in touch with and, 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 you know, really impacted your IQ as a player as well? Yeah, I mean, I've got, um, you know, I got very fortunate, and I tell people this all the time about how fortunate I got, as uh, not only as a, uh, a, you know, in terms of my coaching, but the players, my rookie year. I was on a team, I was on the oldest team in the NBA. Um, and so the most of the guys on the team were years older than me, 13, 14 years older than me. Um, a few of them retired that, that was their last season. Couple guys only played like one more year. Um, you know, one I remember one one guy. Um, you know, a couple guys had kids that were maybe four or five years younger than I was. So I I was in a really really um, different situation because 
you know, these guys were beyond the hazing, the rookie, the rookie games. They were all about, you know, preparing for game night. And, um, that So in terms of, I wouldn't say it was one player. I would say it was my rookie year. And being in the locker room with P.J. Brown, Steve Smith, Stacey Augman, George Lynch, you know, David Wesley, Daryl Armstrong, um, you know, Sean Rooks. Uh, you know, these are some veteran guys that just knew how to make it in the NBA. All these guys were 12 plus year guys. And so who better to learn from, you know, cause I'm looking at them saying, man, how did you do this for 12 years? And they were willing to teach, you know, Stacey Alvin was willing to teach. And Steve Smith was willing to teach George. Lynch. They, you know, they were willing to take me out to lunch, and, you know, do all, you know, sort of get me, mentally in the, in the space where it's like, man, you can, you, you know, you can make this thing work. You don't have to, you know, um, you know, deal with some of the outside noise, figure out what, what works best for you. Um, and they were great examples for how you prepare day to day. And, you know, there was one rule. I couldn't, I couldn't get there after them. So I had to be the first one in the gym and I couldn't be the first one. to leave. That was it. Um, but they, you know, everything in between that was about, you know, the prep that it takes, um, the seriousness that you have to approach, the way you learn and scout people, how you listen to coaches, and you know, you know when to ask for an adjustment, when to you know when to adjust on your own, um, you know how to get yourself going, how to deal with not making shots, you know all the different things mm-hmm. that that come with um, uh, with being a pro. I was able to get it get it honest from the guys that that was on the team with. Mm-hmm. So, what did like a typical day look like for you? From uh, like waking up, food, uh, you know, any, any additional nutrition, workout, you know, maybe maybe during the season, uh, you know, what did that look like for you? As a rookie, or yeah, as a rookie, and then maybe moving on, kind of what you learned and how you adapted over time. Well, as a rookie, you just learn you got you know you have to have you know you have to pregame meals aren't necessarily made for you. Um, so you got to figure pregame meals out on your own. You got to figure out, you know, you know, cause in college they sort of set it up for you. Come and get your meal. It's going to be here. Or <laughs> in the pros, it's, you know, you're on your own, mm-hmm. but the bus is at six o'clock. You know, early bus is at five thirty. Second bus is at six o'clock. And that's kind of the way, you know, you're conditioned. And so you're expected to be in shape, right? That, that's the new, you're not coming to, to school and say, well, you were this condition for a month. You're expected to come to training camp in shape. You're expected to keep, you know, even when the season wears on and you're not practicing, you know, it's not up to the coaches to make sure you stay in shape. You've got to stay in shape. So you got to learn those lessons, um, you know, as a young player. Um, and, you know, you adjust, you know, your eating habits and your training habits to what you're seeking to accomplish. So when I was in New Orleans, um, you know, the first part of my career was all about you know getting stronger, Um you know, I remember playing the Pistons, and I remember they had, you know, Ben Wallace and Rashid and uh, Chauncey Billups. And, uh, I mean, they just had Eldon Campbell, Darvin Ham, some big body, you know, strong, tough, rugged. And I remember I got hurt against them. And I remember mm-hmm. saying, man, they're, I've got to get bigger. I mean, like, these dudes can kill you, man. Like, they were that, you know, 265, 275-pound guys. I'm out there trying to bang with them. I'm 220, 25, you know, getting just annihilated. So I remember setting the benchmark. Like, when I can be successful against the Detroit Pistons, mm-hmm. then I know that I can be successful against the rest of the NBA. And so that was my motivation going into my third year was, you know, I had highlighted the Pistons game. And I said, look, and I was only, we were only going to play him twice. So my thought was, I gotta, I gotta measure myself to how well I compete against them, the physicality, the toughness, um, you know, and whether or not I was headed in the right direction physically. So, you know, we got there. It, it worked. You know, like I said, I was able to put on weight, and then the transition to to Indiana. Um, you know, Frank, you know, Coach Vogel wanted to, wanted to slow it down in terms of he wanted to play. A, uh, you know, a, a tough, rugged, big um, uh, style game. Um, so, uh, you know, he wanted us, you know, he wanted us strong. He wanted us heavy. So, you know, I went from 240 to, I got as heavy as 273 in Indiana. 
Um, and that was, you know, eating was different. You know, you could, you know, I'm eating, you know, 4,000 calories a day trying to maintain that weight because I'm not naturally a big, pl- uh, uh, a big guy like that. You know, lifting four or five times hard a week. Um, you know, my body was completely different when I was in India. You know, I was, a, you know, benching 315 and, you know, starting re- starting sets at 275, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, I'm sweating because over that's, here. <laughs> I'm picturing a bench press was, just falling on my face right now. <laughs> right. But that was, the, that, was the, that was the nature of how we wanted to play um, when I, while I was in Indy. So, you know, we had a good, a good staff there, good training staff. Again, another great, you know, coaching staff with, um, you know, a lot of legendary minds. Um, you know, it's very fortunate at the time. But, you know, as your career wears on, again, as, you know, my last three years, um, you know, after Indy, I, I lost a lot of that weight, um, you know, again, because it was harder to maintain. And then I listened to, or I read a Pat Riley article where he talked about as players get older and they age out, that they need to be lighter. They need to lose weight on the downside, right? As you get older, you need to come down off of some weight so that, you know, your chance for injury comes down, but also your ability to continue to, 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 um, you know, to contribute on the floor, you know, improves because now you're not trying to carry around extra weight, right? Mm-hmm. Um, dealing with younger players that are, you know, stronger, quicker, or, you know, easier to react to stuff or whatever. So taking all of that into account, I was like, well, you know, I can get back down and play at a decent weight. Um, and then the decision to go to San Antonio, um, you know, I still was hovering around 245, 250, but then, you know, going to Golden State, we were going to play past the tempo, Knew I wasn't going to play a, a bunch of minutes, um, and I wanted to be able to contribute. You know, seriously make a contribution while I was on the floor. Um, so I was playing. You know, t- at two thirty five, two forty. You know, my last couple of years in the league, and you know, I was still able to, to to hold my own. I mean, I would. There were nights where I'd be like, I wish I had my, you know, that extra twenty. <laughs> you know, I really, really felt that some nights where I wish I had, you know, my extra twenty pounds, twenty five pounds with me, but. Um, uh, you know, it, again, it all worked out. I, I got out of the game relatively healthy, mm-hmm. um, you know, which was a big deal for me because I do have and did, um, you know, sustain some, some. you know, I got some war wounds. You know, I got I had so, you know, two surgeries on my feet, surgery on my knee, surgery on my elbow, um, you know, serious back injury that I was able to get, um, you know, some intense therapy on um, to correct and manage it, you know, for the last, you know, six or seven years of my career, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to be, I can, I can run up and down with my 11 year old son. I can get on the floor with, with, you know, with my kids and I can, um, you know, I can run, I can play, I can still dunk. I was catching lobs. I just celebrated my 40th birthday, um, at the end of August. So, you know, I can still dunk and shoot the ball. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have gotten out, um, the way that I did, um, and, you know, in relatively good good shape because, um, you know, I'm, I'm more fortunate. All right, you know, even with two screws in my knee and a pin in my foot, I would say that I'm still more fortunate physically than, um, you know, 75, 80% of the guys, you know, because guys really, you know, really do take a toll. I mean, that's the one thing, you know, that uh, is the downside, right, to the professional to professional run is like if you, if you put your time in, um, I was looking at a video today. Oh, they were talking about Grant Hill, and you know he's got basically a, a artificial ankle. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you put your time in, and my 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 youth basketball coach who uh, has, has since passed, but he told us something years ago. I was young, nine, ten years old. He was like, "If you play this game right, you're going to get hurt." Um, and he told me that as a nine, ten year old because you know I was at that age where you know you know you're still playing. You're like. We're not supposed. This is not supposed to hurt. You know, things aren't supposed to hurt. You're not supposed to get elbowed. Why is somebody elbowing me? Why is somebody pushing me? You know what I mean? And he's like, if you, <laughs> if you do the right things while you're on the floor, you know, you're gonna hurt. You're gonna get hurt. Um, you're gonna, you know, the game is gonna take from you. And um, um, you know, like I said, I'm very fortunate to have, uh, you know, to have reason, mm-hmm. reasonably good. Health. Well, and one guy that you uh, competed against, it seemed like all the time, especially uh, with Indiana and with Golden State, was uh, LeBron James. So, what what was it like preparing for a guy of that caliber? 
Man, so, you know, the funny thing about LeBron is, um, you know, he's been, LeBron's kind of been there. Uh, I remember as a freshman in college, he was a freshman in high school. At the end of my freshman year in college, Coach Prosser sent me to a uh, five-star camp to be a counselor because they had really, really high-level runs um, during the week. You know, pro guys, college guys would, would be counselors. And then at night, we'd play in front of Garfinkel and sort of the, the basketball god, you know, that bas- the basketball godfathership that existed with that whole five-star crew. Because, like, if they gave you a stamp of approval back then, you know, everything was was gold. And so um, I'm at that camp, and LeBron is a, is a camper at that camp, and that's the first time I see him play. And then, you know, he was – you could tell he was on a different – you know, he was on a different wave. And then when I saw him again, uh, this was before my senior year in college and his senior year in high school, uh, again, same situation, counselors at the Jordan camp in Santa Barbara. And the evolution that he had made, you know, this is this is like June of um, – uh, of our junior year. And, you know, I'm out there with Heinrich and Nick Collison and a few other, you know, uh, Chris Thomas, a few other guys, you know, top, you know, top, some of the top college guys out there. We're out there uh, to, to have the runs at the end of the night, but it's college. So we're enjoying ourselves. And LeBron is like straight as an arrow. And I remember one night, like we're in there having some beers, you know what I'm saying? We're having a good time. And he's like, I know we are like, we, I, you know, it wasn't just the fact that he was young. Mm-hmm. It was just that he was stealthily focused. And I'm like, man, like, you know, he's already stretching and, you know, in these different routines. He's, you know, he's got people handing him little baggies with healthy snacks in them while we're eating hot dogs and hamburgers. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, damn. So that realization of like this dude's at a different level. And that was a high level group that we were with you know you're talking about you know first team all american you know top players in the acc sec uh, you know big 12 wherever um and he had sort of set himself apart even in that environment and so um you know throughout our careers we clashed we had some some, some battles in um in indiana um again which I, like i said i'm proud of they had a monster team they had mm-hmm. Again, all these be one of the best teams to ever be put together. Um, and they've got, you know, again, a, a, they had a hell of a run there. We, you know, faced them in uh, in Golden State. It was, you know, that's when I realized, like, that's the caliber of team that it takes to beat him. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you've got to have a team with high, high level. I mean, if you think about the Dallas team that beat him while he was in Miami, that, I mean, that's a high-level basketball team that won that beat. LeBron, if you think about the uh, 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 the Spurs, right? We already know what the Spurs are, right? Mm-hmm. That beat um, that beat him. That uh, he, he lost to the Spurs twice in the finals. That's what it takes to beat him, and that's what I realized being in Golden State. It t- it takes that layer of you know you got to have you know some of the best players in their at their position, um, you know some of the smartest best role got role players at their position. You have to have team cohesiveness. You have to have and you have to be clicking on every, literally on every cylinder to beat this guy. Um, uh, if you think about the years that he lost in uh, in Miami or in Cleveland, he was losing to the all-time boss, right? The Boston teams with, with Pierce and Garnett, and those guys, Ray Allen and Rondo, all the fame guys. Um, so that's what, you know, that's what it takes to beat him. And that's the level of impact that he's had or, or the caliber, you know, of guy that he is. I mean, it takes literally the very best you know, to beat him. Yeah, his longevity is just impressive. I mean, I, I can't believe for as long as he's played, he's still playing at the level um, he is even to this day. But how did it right. feel for you to finally get over the hump and win an NBA title? I mean, that has to just be the best yeah, feeling. Yeah. When you get back in the locker room, you got the champagne blasting, everyone's excited. But what did that feel like? Yeah, I mean, it's a great moment. You know, it's um, like I said, it's like, being on top of the basketball world, um, something that, again, you know, something you not necessarily dream about, but you're thinking about that 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 constant grind from, like, I started playing when I was five or six years old, and it's like, damn, you know, you get all the way here, 
you know, you know you're at the end. I was like 36, whatever, 37 years old. Damn, like this is what it feels like to put that pressure on yourself. When I went to Golden State, we talked about the championship every day. You know, we, you know, every shoot around, every, every film session. So we were, we had to be locked in because that was the expectation. It was, you know, we are, we are here to win championships. We're not here to, to lose or to go to the conference finals. We have to win. And that type of pressure every day, um, is immense. And, you know, um, for some greater than others, right? For the guys, who Steph Curry and the Clay Thompsons and the Draymonds and the KDs of the world, who have to carry that burden, um, you know, in terms of the showmanship and, um, you know, making sure that people are coming to the, that's a whole other level. And, um, you know, it, it, seeing all of it come together, being a part, like I said, of, of that group, um, was an awesome, awesome experience, man. Something that I'll never, I'll never forget. And, Again, I needed for my own for my own um, um, sense of, of peace in mind. I wanted to to see how it was done. I wanted to mm-hmm. see how you start, plan, strategize, and complete the task at the end. Um, and that, for me, uh, in my own personal way, is invaluable. Mm. Yeah, the only connection I have to uh, Golden State is I, I grew up playing AAU basketball with Draymond Green, and mm. um, I. Uh, mm. So we, I grew up in Frankenmuth, just outside of Saginaw, and so I would, I would play pickup in pretty much either Saginaw or Flint, and uh, Draymond and I were in the same class with each other, yeah. and um, I knew his level of confidence was at a whole new level very early on in my career because I was, I developed pretty quickly, and my motor skills were really good, and. I was a point right. guard, shooting guard, you know, smaller size. So I had good handles and I could shoot, I could score. And Draymond was much bigger, uh, much taller, kind of still developing his skill. And I think we were in sixth or seventh grade at this time, but he always wanted to bring the ball up the floor. So I would be running point guard yeah. and then occasionally Draymond would be right behind me. He wanted the ball and then, you know, the coaches would be yelling at us like, what the heck are you guys doing? But we were playing in Philadelphia and – I, I can't remember what happened, but at some point our coach took Draymond out of the game. And, right. and, and I think it was because he kept trying to play point guard. And my coach was saying, no, you got to go inside. And so we got about a minute to go in the game. Uh, and it's like a tie ball game or we're up one and we're in the huddle and all of us are in the huddle. And then my coach starts yelling for Draymond. He's like, Draymond, where, where is he? Where is he? And Draymond was on the bench with headphones on. <laughs> he was so <laughs> mad that he wasn't playing. And then he had a 12-year-old on the bench just, uh, with a Walkman and headphones on. So, he, But, he yeah. was, man, he was just always so confident in himself and his ability. And he knew what he wanted to do on the court. So um, I know a lot of people are surprised of what he's done at the NBA level, even me growing up with him and, and watching him develop to a degree, but man, his, his level of confidence, um, just incredible. So I'm sure you have a million Draymond Green stories, uh, but he, he he's beloved in Michigan and, and he's done a lot of great work in Saginaw as well. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, you know, he's a, he's a brilliant basketball mind. Um, like you said, extremely confident, but he's confident in what he knows. So that's the, that's the that's the distinguishing factor. Like he's he's confident because in what he knows and, and the knowledge that he has of the game. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now I mean, you guys. I mean, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green are just incredible guys. So now that you're right. away from the game, I, I know that you have many passions outside of of playing basketball. <laughs> Um, you know, how did you develop yourself in, you know, the areas of life that you have, you know, with being so dedicated to a craft and, you know, in many ways, I think you have to be one track minded to, you know, do some of the things that you've done as a player. Uh, but, you know, it's very apparent in, um, you know, someone who follows you and checks on your interviews and, and, you know, sees what you're doing off the court, that it was always very important to you to have a greater understanding of what's going on around you. So, you know, when did that really become important for you and and how did you even find time during your NBA career to you know develop yourself in the way that you have so before every practice coach Prosser would sit us down on the court and basically have the chairs in a seated manner like a classroom and he would 
have a newspaper article of the day or from the weekend that he read of something going on in the world every day. Every, it was not a practice or shoot around that he did not have, he did not tell us something that was going on in the world, something bigger and something more important than what we were doing. And that was um, key in, for me, because again, a new experience, something that I wasn't accustomed to, but it was a very powerful shift in learning how to shift focus. So when coach would be telling stories or when he would be um, telling us about what we should pull from this article that he had read, and he would maybe read a, a bit from the article to us, it was, Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what we're pulling out of this thing. Maybe it was something about dedication or perseverance, something or a hard story. You know, Coach himself had a very hard story, hard background that he would share with us often. But maybe it was some hardship that someone was dealing with. And he wanted us to see maybe not the hardship, but what they did to get through it, right? What they did to get on the other side of it. And he was always putting us in that, that teachable moment um, space. And so um, I always knew that there was, you could have and you could figure out and care about what was going on in the world. And that relationship between the sport that you're playing and you're participating in didn't necessarily have to be one or the other. They could coexist and they could actually help feed each other, right? Because there are times where we need to get away from the game and we need to be we need to stop being so obsessive about whatever is going on. Like one of the things that, you know, you learn in the NBA is sometimes a day away from the gym, a day away doing something different. Many guys golf, um, you know, other guys play video games, other guys, you know, I had a teammate that was a brilliant artist, but that was something that would take him away um, and give his mind a, a chance to be focused on something other than his field goal percentage his shot. Um, because again, the, there are a lot of different factors and just those, that 12 hours when you take that break um, can help rejuvenate you, can help revive you. And so there's a, there's a role that you know we play as athletes, but there's also a role that we play as human beings and we play as citizens. And as an NBA pro, um, you know, I figured out how to balance both. Um, both spectrums and both ends of that of that um, of that paradigm. We have to be we have to be cognizant of what our reality is. We're human beings. We're citizens in the country, um, and we want to see you know things improve. We want to see um, you know lives of people get better, um, and we should all sort of be adjusted to that as rational human beings. Um, and basketball helps um, for a lot of people, like it did me. It helps us make sense of life. It helps give us a sense of purpose, give you a sense of direction, give you something to aspire toward and reach toward and dream about. Um, and that ultimately helps you evolve as a player. And while you're doing that, right, you're evol- you're, dr- you're dreaming and thinking and um, figuring out ways to, 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 to get to your goal in sport, you're also developing these aspects of yourself in other parts that can be applied in other parts of your life. So you learn how to work with people, right? That's why in the corporate world, in the business world, you know, people tend to use sports, right? And use the analogy of sports and people constantly want to engage the sports world because we understand the dynamics of teamwork, working together, dealing with failure, disappointment, dealing with, you know, again, preparing your butt off, right? We've been there where you work hard, you have a grueling week of practice, you're doing scouting over and over and over. You know the teams, other you know the play calls. You know exactly what they're going, and you lose. And being able to deal with that, being able to bounce back and recover from that, those are things that we as athletes need to learn or should learn how to apply in our everyday lives. Right? We don't. Every day is not going to go the way it's supposed to go. Well, you handle it the same way you would if you were on the court. You know, you you deal with it. You it stings for a while. You go in the locker room. You talk about it. He reviews film the next day. Dang, we should have done this. We should have done that. What do you do now? You let it go. You start preparing for the next one. And that's, you know, again, those are some of, that's some of that value that comes with being an athlete, being a part of the game, being in the sports world. 
Yeah, that connection is key. And, and you know, I think, you know, I'm in more of a business setting now, but, you know, the sports analogies will always be there because of the, the passion and, and emotion that is displayed and the care that you right. see. Um, so, you know, what's next on, on your agenda? Do you have any, uh, or, you know, what are you up to now? And I mean, I could see you going in, in about 10 different directions. I know you're a family yeah. man, you know, you could coaching, teaching, politics, business, uh, you know, do you have anything in mind, uh, right now that you're, you know, maybe more or less interested in? Yeah, I've got some, I've got some businesses, um, that I'm working with. I'm in, um, renewable energy. I'm in, um, you know, professional collegiate sports is a, a, a area that we're working toward. Um, you know, I'm in real estate. Um, I'm, I'm locally here in North Carolina. I own a gym. Um, you know, I work in probably my, this is my passion project will be my passion project for, you know, for my life is, you know, really developing youth talent. Um, you know, I, again, I enjoyed my time as an NBA player and in the NBA ranks, but it would be hard um, for me to, to, to see myself coaching in that space. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I really enjoy working with young people, working with high school athletes, giving them an opportunity, you know, to get better, learn from, you know, from me, um, really relishing the fact of, um, you know, working with my son, my 11-year-old son. Um, and that's really it. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually, um, the, the one thing I am proud of is I'm, I'm actually back in school. I'm at um, North Carolina Central local, uh, you know, historically back college university here in North Carolina, um, getting my master's in history. So um, I should complete that in another year. Um, and really that's it, man. I'm enjoying life. I've got a one-year-old um, um, that we call our retirement baby. Um, <laughs> he's keeping us. He's keeping us young and That's keeping great. us bouncing around, keeping us awake. Um, but it's all good, man. I'm enjoying life. I'm enjoying the family. Um, that was one of the that was one of the bright spots of this of this you know pandemic. And you know when we were, when we had to go into lockdown, I remember feeling like, oh, we're gonna be stuck in the house. And then literally, um, you know, it just made us, you know, it just made you sort of appreciate what you have right in front of you, right? It just. Mm -hmm. It just sort of makes you, you know, we got closer as a family. I learned about my 14-year-old daughter more than I, you know, I'm like, man, like, you're really a, a person of your own. Like, she's not a, you know, you know what I mean? like a little, a little, yeah. a little kid anymore, you know what I mean? Like, can do stuff and handle responsibility and learning, you know, and so these are the things that, I guess, in, in a situation like, um, you know, like this pandemic, we've been able to, to find some positive in it because we have, at least for me personally, we have, you know, I have become closer with my family and we've enjoyed our time in here. I've enjoyed the time with my one year old because when the other kids were one, I was playing basketball. So I didn't, I missed big, you know, I missed a lot of stuff when they were, you know, bitty babies, but this one, I'm seeing it all. Um, been with him just about every day of his first year of life and was not able to do that in any capacity with the other two. So, um, you know, life has a weird way of sort of rewarding you um, when you least expect it. And so it's been, it's been, um, it's been really good, to, you know, for us in terms of, you know, how my, you know, how I'm feeling, how my family is, we're, we're healthy and, um, you know, we're enjoying life in midst of, in the midst of all of this, um, this chaos. That's great to hear. So, well, I'm glad you and the family are all doing fantastic. Happy belated birthday. I do think after this interview, you're going to get a lot of birthday wishes from Xavier Nation if you haven't already. But I'm glad to hear your whole family's uh, doing well. And, uh, man, the impact you've made on and off the court uh, is just tremendous. And uh, Xavier Nation, you know, your name pops up all the time when it comes to Xavier Nation and, and for all the right reasons. So uh, appreciate right. you yeah, jumping on the phone with us. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know, Xavier's a big part of my story. It was a, it was a great, great um, um, stop for me. Um, you know, I owe again, I owe a ton of, of my success, um, particularly as an athlete um, and maturity as an adult. You know, to my time there, I got, you know, I got the most out of it. And, um, again, I always tell people like, if you want to go somewhere where you get the big time, you know, college basketball atmosphere, but you know, you don't necessarily want the big time. Um, 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 you know, college life where you're dealing and competing with, you know, thousands upon thousands of other kids. So Xavier is the ideal spot, especially if you want to lock in, um, you know, and get and get and get that game together. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of the school, big fan of, of the program. I, I keep, I touch base with the coaches and 
whoever you know with Travis and and, uh, and Greg Christopher, the AD, and try to keep a keep a keep a tab on what's going on, and always you know always pick them in my pool. So. All right, thank you for checking out this interview, and if you enjoyed it, please give us a five-star review and keep looking out for more Xavier Basketball 100 Years Podcast interviews. Brown against Burton. Brown starting his dribble. He moves in. He pops up. He shoots. Scores! Lenny Brown! Xavier wins it! The Muskies win it! 71-69! And this the UC Bearcats are number one in the country, number two in their own city!